how has the the landscape changed since then to now as a, as an endocrinologist are you seeing the same conditions as you saw early in your career as you do today uh, again yes and no right as we progress we are learning more right so when we started for many obesity was a cosmetic problem it was just how we appear right so there wasn't a link between there was the, no the excess body weight and metabolic disease exactly exactly right and um, if we draw an analogy if i may right and we go back to 1940s people were looking at the blood pressure as a normal variant was not linked to disease at that point you know blood pressure was high or low but um and you know there is turning points in in life right personal lives or professional lives or the lives of societies right and at that point uh, a beloved american president president roosevelt started having uh, small strokes and he died at the end and this was because of high blood pressure so people started doing studies and linked blood pressure with strokes late 90s F follow me for a minute right i hope i'm not i got you and then what we had in early 50s we said we need to treat i mean our colleagues at that time mm -hmm. we need to treat blood pressure right what was available to us crude sympathectomies surgeries to cut the sympathetic system so from that the doctors learned what is changing after we cut the sympathetic nervous system can we create medications to block it and then can we improve the medications that in the beginning had a lot of side effects and then can, less you refine it and can we refine it? it and then can we find other pathways and now we have several medications we can treat blood pressure yeah. if you go back in terms of obesity 30 years ago people would say it's a cosmetic problem lack of will nothing to do with hormones metabolism then we realize that as we get more obese we have a metabolic syndrome excess fat leads to high blood pressure diabetes cardiovascular disease right more recently we learned that it is linked to fatty liver disease more fat in the liver is responsible for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and now we realize that about 30 percent of cancers are related to obesity so i teach my students if an angel would come to our world and make obesity disappear about 65 percent of endometrial cancers would disappear about 30 percent of epithelial cancers like breast cancer prostate cancer, you know you name it right, would disappear and what most people don't realize today is that a lot of neurocognitive decline Alzheimer's, Parkinson's is related to obesity and metabolic syndrome. So and that's why the rising prevalence of obesity leads to the rising prevalence of all these diseases. So scientists focused on this and there was a turning point 1994-95, so th close to 30 years ago. And this was the discovery of leptin. A hormone the very first prototype adipocyte secreted hormone and when we gave it to mice they lost weight mm -hmm. less appetite less appetite so that was the first proof that gaining weight or losing weight anorexia nervosa right mirror images is not only lack of will there is biological mechanisms that underlie Mm -hmm. this lack of will or less will or stronger will that some people have right so different physiology could mean different drive to eat exactly and then this created an explosion in the field right so leptin is not the only hormone that is secreted from fat to give to the brain the message how much energy we have stored in fat in lean people you are lean right you receive the message you change your appetite and the way you exercise so that would be i'm leptin sensitive sensitive and there is some people who are leptin tolerant so leptin may go up but they do not respond 
right? And then we realize that leptin is only one of the adipokines. There is dozens. The system is very complicated. We need artificial intelligence. <laughs> we were talking about artificial intelligence. But then we realize that the brain receives messages from other organs, right? And it makes sense if you think about it. You don't need to be a rocket scientist, right? So muscle, we exercise. Of course, the brain needs to receive a message from myokines. Hormones that are secreted from muscle goes to the brain, changes the way the brain, you know, uh, approaches food and exercise and gives feedback to muscle. What is the most important organ for our food, right? The GI tract, the stomach and the gastroenterology tract, right? There is incretins, hormones, and we realize one after the other who they are and we study them in the lab. That the stomach and the GI tract secretes hormones to go back to the brain and tell us after we eat, stop eating. It's like the breaks. It's the break. So this is a short-term break. And leptin is more longer-term signal, right? So how much energy we have in uh, stored in our body, right? So that short-term break, are you speaking of hormones like GLP-1? Like GLP-1 was the prototype. GLP-2, and you name it, right? So now we realize that um, there is a big molecule called preproglucagon, and it's cleaved into several other products, like eight of them. And it's differentially cleaved in the brain, the GI tract, and our pancreas, right? And all these hormones, uh, number one, in physiology, provide feedback to the brain. In pharmacology, we are leveraging this now, right? To create medications that are stronger and last longer. Do, do you understand? Yeah, so, so that we can. You know your point about willpower? Yeah. Do you think uh, it sounds like it's not really an even playing field? Like some people are dealing with heightened yeah. uh, hunger relative to the next person. Right. Is it is it that you. You put on weight, and then as a result of that, you become leptin tolerant. Or is it that, be it genetics or other reasons, certain people are just more leptin tolerant or have less GLP-1 sensitivity um, from birth? Yes. No, this is a very good question. Um, and we tend to, uh, to believe these days that and this is the, our culture out there, right? That there should be no differences, everybody is equal, and we are equal, and right? But in terms of our genetics, we are so similar, but also so different, right? Some of us have a predisposition, right? To be more obese, or to be less obese, right? Or predisposition to develop diabetes. Even if you have obesity, I mean, let's, let's go deeper, if I may, right? Um, not each and every, and we have realized that not each and every obesity is also the same. So some of us have more or less storage space in their adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. All of us have the subcutaneous adipose tissue. I've heard people describe that as a personal fat threshold. There is a threshold, right? So some of us have a small storage space. Like think about your uh, apartment, your house, right? And you have your storage room, right? Some people have little storage space, others have plenty of it, right? So for those of, of us who are fortunate to have a lot of storage space, potentially, in our subcutaneous uh, adipose tissue, you can store their fat, your body weight can increase, and to the extent that fat remains where it is supposed to be, in the subcutaneous adipose tissue, you have no medical problems. So if it stays in the storage room, not a problem. Not a problem. But if it's overflowing into the living room and the kitchen. That's when you start creating problems. Right. So about 20, 22% of um, people, especially women, maybe slightly more obese, if fat is not uh, spilling over in other organs, we call them metabolically healthy obese. Could be chubby or obese.
There is no problem, no need to treat them, right? But if the fat goes where it should not be, liver can cause fatty liver disease, can cause cirrhosis and liver failure, death over a period of decades, right? Not over a period of months. If it goes to muscle, it causes insulin resistance for people who are predisposed to develop insulin resistance. And the longer and the higher the degree of insulin resistance, the higher the risk to develop diabetes. If it goes to our vasculature, it's the same process. Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. It goes to our brain, right, and causes inflammation, uh, neurocognitive decline, Alzheimer's. So you got to keep fat out of the muscle, fat out of the arteries, <laughs> fat exactly. out of the liver, fat exactly. out of the brain. And and the, the right. And the, the, the very first, right, <laughs> and um, most indicative marker is the belly fat, intra-abdominal fat, right? So if you see intra-abdominal fat, you know that most probably you have fat in muscle, you have fat in the liver, you have ectopic fat. Other than just observing someone, is that something that you would become aware of through doing a blood test and looking at biomarkers, or is it a scan? Yes, that's that's beautiful. That's a beautiful question. So this is a work in progress, right? So we started uh, several years ago with a crude uh, indicator, BMI, body mass index, and this uh, was started by insurance companies, uh, Simon, because they had an interest and they still have an interest, right? So BMI is simple crude index correcting weight for height. But we realize that this is not, as, as we realize what is happening, that this is not reflecting a topping fat or, uh, right? So then we started looking into waist circumference. Which is a little bit more sp it's specific to like body fat distribution. Exactly, a little bit more specific, right? But again, uh, different races mm -hmm. um, have different numbers. And they tend to have, say, Southeast Asians, they tend to have lower BMIs. But for a lower BMI, they don't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue. They accumulate fat in the stomach. But still, is not the best, right? We need to refine it. So now, inexpensive markers, right? We correct waist circumference for height. We have to correct it, right? Because the waist circumference depends also on height, right? But if one wanted to be even more specific, we now know which are the hormones that are secreted from overall fat. And this is leptin. You gave it the hormone leptin from the Greek word leptos, meaning thin. It's and I'll, uh, we, we are talking about obesity, but I can explain to you about what happens in anorexia nervosa or, or, or thin people, right? Because these are mirror images. And there is another hormone that we have done a lot of work on, is called adiponectin. And adiponectin reflects the intra-abdominal fat. And this is a hormone and um, an inflammatory marker, anti-inflammatory marker. And the more the intra-abdominal fat, the lower the levels of this hormone. The higher the risk for diabetes and fatty liver disease and cardiovascular disease. So you can measure it. So the more intra-abdominal fat. The lower the levels of this beneficial protective hormone. Adiponectin. Yes. And you can request that on a standard blood test? Uh, most laboratories should have it. The big, the big laboratories have both of them. Uh, it's not yet um, standard uh, biomedical practice, but we are getting there. It's research that is becoming practice. But if you go to LabCorp or uh, I don't want to, you know, advertise any, you know, uh, the big um, national laboratories, they can measure it. Now, you mentioned about uh, scans, right? MRIs or CAT scans. Yes, uh, we can measure it. With CAT scans or MRIs, we can measure not only how much fat you have, but also whether the fat is in muscle or in the liver. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty accurate. Uh, the problem is that they are expensive. Mm. So you cannot do it many times. You cannot f follow people with that. Uh, you can break the bank. Right? What, what do you think the... about a, a DEXA scan or liver, liver ultrasound? Yes. So the liver ultrasound, 
um, and there is several companies that are making uh, ultrasounds for the liver, is very specific, but not sensitive enough. So if you have more than, f let me start by saying that a normal person should have no more than 5% fat in their liver. So the ultrasound is, is very specific if the amount of fat in the liver is more than 30%. Between 5 and 30% is a gray zone that is not pretty good in picking it up. So if you have a lot of fat, the ultrasound will find it. But if you have between 5 and 30%, is not as good as an MRI or measuring it. So that's that makes it not a great option <sighs> for kind not of... Not a great option. For a lot of people who might be on the fence. No, no. We are not using uh, ultrasounds these days for uh, fatty liver disease. And DEXA? DEXA scan is pretty good in terms of overall fat. We don't have it. It's not available like everywhere. It's not as expensive as an MRI, but more expensive than running a hormone. Um, cannot tell us a lot about which organ has fat or not, but it, it can tell us the overall fat mass. Mm -hmm.